Hello and welcome to Postgres FM, a weekly show about all things PostgreSQL. I am Michael, founder of PG Mustard. This is my co-host Nikolai, founder of Postgres Zero. Hey, Nikolai. Hi, Michael. How are you? Good. How are you? Very good. Well, yeah, me too. Um, yeah, largely for because... Asking. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Like, oh, how yeah. are you? Yeah. I'm here too. Yeah. If you just want to keep chat among yourselves, I'll, I'll just wait here. Look, look, we have a guest today. <laughs> yeah, hi. Yeah, we are delighted to have a guest today, and it is uh, the one and only Haki Benita, technical lead and database enthusiast, who also writes an excellent blog over at hakibenita.com that we've mentioned many times on the podcast before. Um, he also gives popular talks and training sessions. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Big fan, very excited. Yeah. The blog is great. <laughs> if if someone didn't read it yet, like it's it's a must read for, I think, and long reads, right? It's long reads, but not very frequent. I guess it's not possible to make them frequent, right? Yeah, it's a lot of work. Funny story is uh, we agreed that our bot will have uh, your blog post in our knowledge base. Yeah, that's right. And thank you for that. And uh, like a few days ago, I told the team, like, you know, like this part of our knowledge base was not updated since January, since alpha release. And now we are approaching like better release. And they said, no problem, we'll update and pay attention to this block, block uh, I said. And then they, they came and said, we have up updated, only one article added since January. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, but it makes sense because long reads require a lot of time. I know it very well, right? So, yeah, it takes a very long time to produce these types of articles. Yeah, I know. I've been writing for a very, very long time and I've been very surprised about this article. I'll be honest with you, you know, after you write, for some time, you start to develop like a sense of which ones are going to do like well and be very accepted and which ones are going to be like, you know, just one for the, for the archives. So, you know, when I wrote stuff like comparing pandas to, uh, to SQL, I knew that it's going to be a hit because people like pandas. And if you say pandas is slow, then people are going to hate you. And when I wrote this, uh, me, me and Michael wrote something about hash indexes a few years back, and I think it's a top result for Postgres hash index on just about every search engine. So that one, you know, you, you released that one, you know that it's going to do well. But then I released this one. I said, man, it's so long, such a niche problem. No, no chance anybody's actually going to read all of that. And I was very surprised by the amount of responses that I, I received to this article. And I think the most surprising comment that I received on this article is that a lot of Postgres people didn't know about merge. Now I came from, huh. I came from Oracle. So okay. I knew all about merge. And actually when I came to Postgres, I wrote a lot of ETL processes and I really wanted merge and I didn't have merge. So I had to learn about insert on conflict. So a lot of people told me this is the first time I heard about merge. Such a cool command. Be because it's new. It's still new. Yeah, I know. It was added to 15, right? 15. Yeah. So it's super new. And also, to be honest, insert on conflict is like what you want, 99% of the cases. Mm -hmm. And while merge is nice, I think that on conflict is, uh, you seem pissed. Why, why did I say? <laughs> well, because you described in your article why it's bad, right? Let's talk about why it's bad. These gaps and sequences like uh, bloat, created yeah. This, is, yeah this is not what people want right i know let's, i know let's step let's step back like our uh, michael likes us to uh, pronounce the topic right topic <laughs> is, topic you know, is... You know, i have to tell you something i have to tell something it's funny okay i have to tell something so when we talked i talked with michael about this doing this show and i asked him okay let, let's do it can you give me like a rough outline of how it how, how it's going to go and he told me I can tell you how it's going to go, but to be honest, if Nikolai is going to be on the show, then I can promise anything. <laughs> I can't promise any structure. Well, I, I see you are the same type of person, actually. You, I don't know. You delivered like on yeah. the first five minutes. Don't follow the agenda, right? So you said that you were surprised this topic will be popular, but how come it's super popular? It's just like in computer science, particularly in databases, find or create. This is like a super common pattern, right? 
And the fact that in Postgres, the solutions have so many pros and cons, uh, like it's super interesting because everyone needs it actually. Yeah. You build something, you want this, right? Yeah. I'm going to tell you a secret. After I published this article, I actually discovered that there are still situations where you get very unpredictable results. Okay. Mm. And, 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 and I've done some experimenting in the past two weeks based on comments that I received and I haven't cracked it yet. Mm. Yeah. So it's a lot more complicated. Like what? And I'll even tell you another secret. There's a very, in my opinion, an unexpected difference between the way merge and insert on conflict behave under different circumstances. But, you know, we promised Michael that we describe the topic before we actually dive into the details. Right. <laughs> let's, let's name the topic. And then, yeah. Yeah. Well, I was interested in your thoughts on this actually, because I feel like you deliberately called your blog post get or create, whereas from the database side of it, I've always thought of it as like insert or select. And I think Nicola has called it that, but in the past, in like a how-to guide and things. So we'll, we'll link up the blog post and we'll link up Nicola's how-to. And there's like a few other things. Uh, I think one of the things you're referencing about how it's become even more complicated in the last few weeks was like, you linked me to a great answer by Erwin Brandstetter on Stack Overflow that discusses this as well. But it's a surprise. It sounds really simple, right? Select or insert get or create, it seems such a simple piece of functionality and in small, low traffic systems, it can be like, you can, like any newbie developer could come up with a solution to this problem. Yeah. It's just gets complicated when you have to factor in concurrency and, uh, MVCC implementation and things. So yeah, I, I loved your post. I found it really interesting how complicated this could get. But yeah, maybe we should start simple and like, it'd be great to hear a little bit about it. Like, you, you both said it's quite a common thing that you come, like you have to implement it quite often. I haven't had to that often. Like I've got a couple of occasions, but not at, maybe not as often as you do. So I'd be interested to hear like where you're coming across this. Okay. So my use case was very similar to what I actually implemented in the article because I had this organization table and we had members and we wanted to have users be able to tag members with their own tags. And we wanted to encourage reuse of tags, otherwise they don't make much sense. So we've set up this very simple HTML form. Now, HTML forms are not SPAs, they're not, they're not very complicated. You can't send JSON, you just send list of names, like from a radio selection or like an autocomplete, whatever. So at the end of the day, the server receives a list of strings and he wants to set these tags on the member. Now, if the tag exists, you want to reuse the tag. And if the tag does not exist, you want to create a new tag and get the ID. Because the next step would be get all the IDs and put them in the uh, table associating tags with members, right? So that's the, the, the first part where you have a list of tag names and you want to get or create tags. This is where I, I came to this idea. Now, the thing that surprised me is that now this is not a very high traffic part of the application. I could have done the brute force approach it would have been just fine, but you know, I, I wrote some unit testing and one of the tests was, let's see what happens when you just have an existing tag. You want to make sure that it's reused. So I used insert on conflict, do nothing with returning star. So I expected that if I insert, for example, two tags and one of them already exists, I expected to get two tags in return. But in fact, what I got was just one tag. So this was very strange to me. So at this point, I started investigating, you know, and, and starting to explore why this is happening. And in fact, the, the first thing that I thought about was let's do a meaningless update. Like instead of doing on conflict, do nothing. I did on conflict set ID equals excluded ID. Like let's fool the database into thinking that this tag was modified. So I get, get that in return, but it really bugged me because it, it's very like, <laughs> it's a very ugly solution. Why would I want to update something for no reason just to get it back? 
So this is where, you know, all the, the different scenarios started to uncover. And as I tested farther and farther, I came to the conclusion like, hell man, why is this so complicated? I mean, this, this is what database and applications do. This should be so simple. Why is this so complicated? And then I started digging. And one of the places that I uh, eventually arrived was Django. Django is a, a web framework and there's uh, an implementation of get or create. And what Django is doing, they try to fetch the record. If they find it, they return it. If they don't find it, they try to insert, right? But then, <laughs> and that's like the funny part, the non-intuitive part, then they actually handle an integrity, unique constraint violation, and then they try to get it again. This is the select, insert, select. But then it gets even more complicated because if you have a unique constraint violation inside a transaction, it aborts the transaction, right? So you need to wrap the second insert in another transaction, right? Or use so, subtransactions. I think exactly. Django by default uses subtransactions, which is a very bad idea, actually, but we will talk about it later. The, the reason that he uses subtransactions, and I know you're a very big fan of subtransactions, you use them all the time. You encourage everybody to yes. use subtransactions. Yes. You wrote a very long blog post about why they are <laughs> absolutely great and you should use them all the time. <laughs> but the reason that uh, you do that in, uh, in, in Django, the reason that they're doing that is because if you happen to call this function inside a transaction of your own, and if you reach a unique constraint violation, it gets your transaction aborted. So that's a problem. So the only way that Django can make sure that they don't get your transaction aborted is to execute this part in a subtransaction of its own. Now, there's also another very interesting thing that happens here. And this is also something that I mentioned in the article. Python encourage asking for forgiveness. So in Python, the item says that you should try something and then handle all the possible exceptions. So trying to insert a record and then handle the unique constraint violation is actually consistent with how you're expected to do things in Python. But it kind of conflicts with the way Postgres handles the situation because in Postgres, when you have an exception inside a transaction, it aborts the transaction, which is not a very good thing. So. The approaches between how you would do things in Postgres and how you would do things in, in Python kind of clashed in this case. I thought it was very interesting. So, you know, I, I explored different approaches, like what would be the equivalent of asking for forgiveness in Postgres? What would be the equivalent of looking before you leap, check all the preconditions in advance? So, uh, yeah, it turned out to be way more complicated than I anticipated. Yeah. That's interesting. And uh, you explored several properties, right? Uh, bloat, concurrency, constraint, and the uh, idempotency, right? So, idempotency, yeah. I don't. So, I'm very curious. I saw some uh, parts of benchmarks, but you decided not to include the performance to the resulting table yeah. when you compared methods. Uh, why so? Performance is also interesting, right? Performance is interesting, and I saw I saw some articles that do this from a performance point of view. In my situation, performance was not a concern. I was more focused on getting the the functional attributes that I wanted, like item potency, for example, was a lot more important to me than make it fast. Because at the end of the day, you you don't update lots of tags. You probably set no more than five. So performance was not a concern. I did want to focus on the functional attributes. Also, it got pretty long. So at some point you need to let something yeah. go, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. Let's maybe talk about um, your favorite method right now and for future. For future, I guess it's merge, right? Because in Postgres 17, it will have a returning clause. Actually, I didn't know. And when I read about it in your blog post, I immediately thought, oh, this is a candidate to be one of my favorite additions to Postgres 17. I somehow overlooked it. So it was great. Before, like, Merge was added to Postgres 15. It was being developed more than 10 years, I think. It was a huge story. 
but it lacks returning in 15 and 16. Now in 17, to be yeah. released soon, it's receiving returning. And it looks like all your checkboxes are green, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, it should be favorite. Like you will, you would choose this if you already was on. We are on Postgres 17, but before 17, what's your favorite method? Well, insert on conflict. Do not think with a union is is currently my way to go, and I, I expect it to remain my go to approach. Um, mostly because of habit and also because I experimented with the new merge under different circumstances in Postgres 17. And it turns out that merge can actually fail with unique constraint violation. Hmm. So I found it unexpected. I don't know because I don't know much about how these two are different in the underlying implementation, but I'm guessing that they are not implemented the same way. And we talk about it committed level, yes, right? Because of course. It, I think it also matters, right? Yeah. So the lowest. Yeah. Mm. So so after I, I published this article, I uh, some a reader reached out to me and he said, I really liked your post and everything is very comprehensive, blah, blah, blah. But there is one race condition that can still mm. cause inconsistent results. So basically, if you have two sessions inserting the exact same tag at the exact same time, then you can end up with a situation where using insert on conflict, you would not get item potency, meaning the first statement would return the tag, but the second would return nothing. And the reason for that is when you start the first transaction, you insert the tag A. So tag, tag A does not exist and insert, insert the tag, right? And then you get mm -hmm. that in return, but then you don't commit. Now another session starts, the transaction begins, and now you do the exact same thing. You do insert tag A on conflict, do nothing, returning star. And then you select from the table and select from the returning. What's happening now is interesting because right now the row is locked. So the second session hangs. So now you commit the first session. So the second session at this point is going to return nothing. And the reason is insert on conflict locked. It encountered a unique constraint violation. So the row was not inserted. But then when you try to select from the table, it found nothing because the snapshot yeah. is older than the other transaction. So yeah. this is a scenario where, where you get, you don't get item potency. You expect to get the same output in both cases, but you don't. And the more interesting thing is if you do the exact same exercise with merge, you get different results. What do you get? Can you guess? I found it to be surprising. If you do the exact same experiment with merge, you are going to get unique constraint violation. Even though you can say in the merge clause, you can say on conflict, do nothing. When match, do nothing. You are still going to get unique constraint violation. So this raises a question of whether merge is really, or I, I would, I would want to say something like, is it safe in concurrent, highly concurrent reloads? But it doesn't do what it promises. Better understanding right? of how merge handles these types of situations, you know? Hmm. Yeah, it shouldn't produce con unique constraint violation in read committed, but it does. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but it's easy. It is. It should be easy to check based on your, what you say. Like if you just do PG bench m multiple sessions in parallel doing the same thing, right? It, it, it's very easily reproducible. You just need two terminal windows and you can immediately replicate it. I, the thing I found to be, okay. I would say disturbing. Yeah. And I'm using air quotes for those of you just listening is that when you do merge and you set on match, do nothing, you don't expect to get unique constraint violation. Right. Like if I wrote this statement in my code, I would not handle unique constraint violation. Mm -hmm. Okay, because if I'm inserting into a row and I know that it can raise, I would handle the situation 
and do whatever I need to do. But I would not expect to get integrity error when I explicitly handle the case where there is a match. So I found this to be surprising. So to answer your previous question, what would I use now? And that's a, that's a tough choice between you don't get the expected result to you get an exception. You know, when I'm thinking about it right now, I think that it kind of makes sense to get the exception, <laughs> right? Yeah, well, I, I guess we're moving from the end of article backwards, right? So I'm not sure this, the problem you describe, you know, is it discussed somewhere? Like, and do you know, like, like this behavior, was it discussed in mailing lists or somewhere, no? I don't it's know, maybe I, I'm guessing that it might have, but I haven't seen any. And it also, as you said, it's kind of new in Postgres. So it's possible that some of the people that worked on it didn't have enough time to actually document it. I, I wouldn't say document, but maybe write these types of articles on it, analyzing how it behaves under different circumstances. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm curious. I, I think this should be documented. Maybe, it's, maybe it's actually documented. We should check, but it's super interesting. I never used merge in production, never, never, ever, <laughs> but, but yeah, so what I, I'm, well, honestly, most production systems are still behind a lot in terms of major version, but uh, moving backwards in short on conflict, do nothing or do update. This is interesting because, so we said our goal is find or create or like get or create, right? Yeah. But when you say, let's also update, it's like third layer of logic, right? Find or create, but if you found also update, like it's, it's more complicated. I like it, but it's already a different task, right? Yeah. Well, you know, when I wrote lots of ETL, I don't know, 15 years ago in, in Oracle, I used merge all the time. It was like right. a third hand. Every time I needed to do anything, I would use merge because when you do ETL processes, you're basically taking data from one place and you want to sync it to some kind of target. So you use merge all the time. In Postgres, I kind of gotten used to not using it. And also some may also claim that the whole uh, ETL, the way that we do ETL now is kind of different than the way we used to do ETL 15 years ago. A lot of it is the same, but some of it is still kind of different. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's interesting. And, I, and hopefully when more people adopt merge, I know that it was a very desirable yeah feature, right? A lot of people wanted that, right? Oh, people right. were very exciting yeah. when it came out. It was all in the, what I anticipate, what I expect most end version, uh, you know, the merge command. So hopefully we're going to see some people doing interesting stuff with merge. Yeah. And I was surprised to see, uh, so there is difference between, uh, in certain conflict, do nothing and do update in the table you provided in the end of the article and do update. There is a like red cross in the column of bloat, meaning that it has bloat issues, obviously update. Okay. But also you have a, a green checkbox for in certain conflict, do nothing. The thing is that when we created our bot, we also use in certain conflict, do nothing for knowledge base. For example, if your article get, gets inserted, uh, it's like it searches if this URL is known already. Right. Uh, and uh, if it's known already, do nothing. We decided not to apply update yet. So I was surprised to see you, you, you concluded that there is no bloat issues because we had a lot of activities, a lot of data to insert, and it suffers from bloat. We have you gaps. Are... So if you have collision, right? So you inserted something, you try to insert and do nothing. It actually generates that tuple, I think. No? No, I think that, no? uh, first of all, gaps, yeah, gaps for sure. I just checked yeah, gaps, gaps for, for sure. sure. Yeah, gaps for right. sure. And okay, I know what you're talking about. You, you, you're talking about the, the, the issue of bloat, right? Bloat. So right. this is also a very interesting topic, which I briefly mentioned, but I think that this is also something that some people commented about that they weren't aware of the fact that it causes bloat. So apparently in Postgres, when you have unique constraint violation, it can cause bloat because the way it works is that Postgres tries to, uh, it basically inserts the row into the, the table and then it checks that there are no unique constraint violations, right? And if there is a unique constraint violation, this row is marked as dead, which causes bloat. So this is 
what's happening if you rely, heavily rely on catching unique constraint violation. However, 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 and this is also in the original RDS article, which is how I found out about it. It was also very unexpected that unique constraint violation would cause bloat. But according to the article and according to the benchmarks that I've done, when you use insert on conflict, it uses a different mechanism that can check in advance for collisions, which prevents bloat. So I'm pretty confident that insert on conflict do nothing yeah. to not cause, yeah. cause bloat, uh, which is a big plus for do nothing. And uh, also, you know, we, we talked before about the difference between how you do things in Python, like asking for forgiveness versus look, look before you leap. So in Python, the pattern that is encouraged, basically try to answer something and then handle the exception, can end up causing lots of bloat, which is a problem. So if you have a process with lots of collision where you actually rely on unique constraint violation, this is something that you need to think about. Right. So yeah, I double checked. Uh, you're right. No bloat, but the sequence, sequence gaps are happening. With, yeah, sequence uh, gaps. Like, do nothing. You know, there was a period where I like to ask in uh, job interviews, how would you implement gapless sequences? <laughs> well, have you yeah. ever talked about this? The evil question. Evil, evil question. question. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it, it has many like depths to go into, right? Yeah. Deeper, deeper, deeper. Yeah. There's a company that a few of my friends and former colleagues work at called incident.io. They do like incident management within things like Slack and Teams. And they had this issue where they, well, they blogged about it, but they wanted gapless sequences for their instant numbers. They, they didn't, the customers got confused by the idea of the instant number jumping by like five when they'd only had, you know, they've had one incident, then a second incident, and a third incident, and suddenly they're on incident six. What happened? So they, there's a really nice blog post there. Um, we can yeah, call explain it how sequence they were, bloat, right? Yeah, yeah. But I'm curious why... Like, why are you bothered by sequence gaps, Nikolai? Like, why is that an issue? Well, it's not a big issue. It's okay, just, cool. it might be an issue for some cases, but I actually, I don't care. It uh, gave me false impression that there is bloat. Mm, That's why. But, but now I double checked. Haki absolutely right. No <laughs> bloat. In, for, so in certain conflict, do nothing probably is the winner in Postgres 16 well, or older. I've I, I got I a had, question. Yeah. I've yeah. got a question here because you mentioned the kind of trade-off between the, well, the issues in the highly concurrent cases or like the, the potential issue of insert on conflict, do nothing, returning null if, if you happen to have this uh, case with the two concurrent sessions, inserting the exact same tag at the same time. Wouldn't insert on conflict do update avoid that is issue at the cost of some Bloat. Well, that, that's well, a yes. different yeah. issue. The issue I describe is that when you have two transactions trying to insert a new tag at the same time, the same new tag at the same time, then the second on conflict would not do anything and it would also not return anything. This is the unexpected part because one of my requirements is that the operation would be idempotent. So if I give it tag A, I expect to get an ID yeah. return. So in this case, there is a scenario where I provide it with a list of N tags and I get less than N tags in return. But if so, they both updated, imagine if both concurrent sessions were doing in certain conflict update, they both get to the update stage. You get two updates, but you still get back all the tags that you wants to insert. First of all, first of all in, in my uh, scenario, I don't update. This is a very, uh, yeah. a lot of people got this uh, very confused. This is why I added a comment. And some people mm -hmm, made mm -hmm. like a uh, very, uh, let's call them funny comments about it. Okay. <laughs> but there's a difference between upsert where you want to update or insert, which sure. is also a very, uh, a very popular pattern. In this case, by the way, it's simpler. Because if you actually update the row, then it's going to get returned by returning star. Returning. Yeah. yeah. So that's like a, the easy case. In my case, I don't want to touch the row, but I still want to get it back. This is why get or create is like a more difficult variation of upsert, if, if you will. Okay. So uh, there, there's a tricky part. 
So apparently there's no good solution. By the way, the block, the, the post by Irwin on stock overflow lands on a brute force solution where you basically loop until you get what you expect. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I would have, uh, if I, 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 maybe this is the way to go. <laughs> loop where in, in a different language or in PLPGSQL? He ended up writing a function where you essentially loop until you stop getting uh, okay. unique yes. constraint violations. Yeah. But you, you need the uh, sub transactions. So this is no go for me, definitely, right? <laughs> Yeah, this doesn't scale. I mean, this... Uh, Nikolai, you are a man with a mission. <laughs> well, I, it's it's no joke. I, I, we have clients literally last week. Uh, I spent like half one hour and people went and, and switched off it in Django because they it hurts. It hurts uh, constantly, people. Like sub-trans SLRU, wait a minute. It happens all the time. So the fact that Django by default uses them and people don't realize and then come to us with sub salary, it's good for my income, right? But uh, <laughs> it's bad in, in generally, in general, right? By the way, I wanted to highlight one thing. If you do insert on conflict, do nothing, returning star, it won't return anything if row is already exists. I just wanted to highlight that you, you have a trick. You use CTE, right? And then select for such case, right? Yeah. Additionally, uni with union, right? Yeah. That's or right. Union or what? Yeah, union this is the only way that you can actually communicate between parts of a query. Otherwise, they all see the same snapshot and you don't get... This is, this is a trick also not straightforward at all, honestly. Yeah. Like some people can move away from insert on conflict do nothing just because of that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. One of many cool tricks in that book. <laughs> <laughs> I went through this yeah. process where I try to figure out, wait, I just inserted this row. Why would I select? Outside the CTE, I don't give it to me. It. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I understand there's some cost to upset, but given the complexity we're running into here, is it? Would you both see it as acceptable to pay that that extra cost? The kind of heavier. Uh, I know you. I know you mentioned the kind of double hit of the table being annoying, but like those updates, even though they'd be setting the tag name to the exact same tag name, o potentially over and over and over again, I just see the, the guarantees that that provides is so attractive, personally. I'll be honest with you. I understand what you're saying, and you're probably correct. This is like the practical approach, but I would not mm. do it. It just bugs me. I would not do it. <laughs> I would not do a meaningless update just to say, I would just do yeah. two queries. I would insert and then I would select separately. It's like uh, insert all back, insert all back, you end up having a lot of bloat uh, depending on the yeah. concrete situation. So this, yeah. so sub transactions and bloat, huge limitations of performance here, right? I know. I mm -hmm. think this is a scenario, this is a case where you kind of understand uh, the limitation and restrictions of the database and you kind of end up solving it at the application level. Now, mm -hmm. as you mentioned at the beginning, I know that I, well, get or create is, is useful, but I haven't had a chance to implement it as much Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, for the rare occasion where I actually need to do get or create, I would just do it at the application level because as it turns out, it's very complicated at the database level. Right. In application, it becomes simpler. You like, you don't deal with, probably don't deal with subtransactions and bloat, but, uh, latency, like route trip times between attempts to do one step, another step, it, incre it increases chances of feathers right i mean collisions yeah. and so on yeah so. but you know if if uh, my main business is to <laughs> get or create i would come up with a very innovative solution put a lot of engineering work into it but if it's just updating tags for members in an organization i would go yeah but i understand what you're saying i spent a lot of time doing unnecessary optimizations on you know weird places in the code just for fun i do it all the right. time yeah, like 90% of my blog post is inspired by these uh, strange endeavors where I try to optimize things. <laughs> so yeah, I, this is interesting. And I think that this very simple problem surfaced a lot of issues. I also learned a lot from writing this. It got me uh, 
interested in, in speculative insertion, the mechanism used by insert on conflict. It, I think, brightened my understanding of how the interaction between different queries and uh, common table expressions work within the same query. You know, lots of things that I'm now aware of them. So at least I'm better equipped to debug issues I might have and don't even know about. Yeah. Yeah, I really liked it as a journey. I, I would encourage people to read this, even if they don't have this problem, uh, just as a, almost as a, just to watch somebody go through this problem. Uh, and, you know, it, I feel like you've included things as well. I like the, there's one section that's, I took a wrong turn yeah. as well, like that. And that's so helpful to share those things with people, because otherwise you can read some of these blog posts and they just sound like the person knows, like, just got it right straight away. And it's quite frustrating as somebody that quite often goes down long term for me reading those. So yeah. I appreciated that. I just, I wish you had also some warning about subtransactions anyway. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Nicola, you know, warning, you know but... what? Let me just change the banner at the top of the website. Instead of the about page, I would just place like this huge warning. They don't use sub transactions. Let me put it right here. If you see uh, PLP GSQL with uh, begin except, uh, except exception when or something so anyway nested begin uh end, end blocks this is sub transaction so yeah but in this case it's warranted because otherwise it cancels any calling transaction so that would be the right. responsible thing to do in this case but you know what maybe it needs a comment saying this is a good sub transaction it's not a good sub transaction because if you have high this is the least worst type of sub transaction I cannot agree with here because uh, you talk about, you talk, you explore uh, collisions and concurrency issues. Yeah. That means uh, you think that there will be a lot of sessions issuing this, this query. It means eventually the project will bump into this wall. Yeah. Right. Good sub transactions is, is for example, DDL, uh, which mm. happens not often in one session. This is good sub transaction. And, and even the, and even there it can become bad. But here I, I cannot agree because we should consider multiple sessions fighting and this is where yeah. things can be wrong. What you're saying reinforces what I'm saying that in this situation, because it's so complicated in the database, I would just elevate that to the application yeah. level and try to find it yeah. a, a solution there to avoid all the complexity. Yeah. But it was a nice like thought exercise. Understanding just retry a regular, regular transaction. Just retry regular transaction, maybe right. Yeah, it should not be such complex, right? I know. I was surprised that it was so complicated. Why, why is it so? <laughs> what do you like? What would you both like as a is 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 it that you would like merge to work as expected? Like, what is the nice solution on the database side for this? Well, the dream syntax would be for select do nothing returning star to just return everything. Right. That would be like the mm. dream syntax. I think part of the problem is that returning star is quite like not super popular thing, which was added later to insert and update and delete. It was not originally there. So yeah. it's not super natural thing, right? Also, once you've defined that behavior, it's so difficult to like, you can't change the behavior for existing applications. No, you anymore. can't. And I can even give you an example yeah. because you usually use insert on conflict with, you know, th there is no merge command in, in Postgres. So mm -hmm. if you want to sync mm -hmm. data, you use insert on conflict and then when match, do nothing. Okay. And more often what you want to do is you want to avoid the unnecessary update. So you do when matched, do update where something actually changed. Okay. And then some rows ends up not being affected. So at this point, you do returning star. And then usually what I like to do in my ETL processes is I count the rows so I can log how many rows were affected, right? So now the question is, if I expect to get the number of affected rows, <laughs> we go for a circle here, I know. So if I'm just expecting the, the affected rows, then if I'm going to get rows that were not affected, also very strange, right? Right. Yeah. So what's the conclusion? Come on, guys. I mean, what, what's the conclusion? Okay. Just do it in the application. Don't, don't go there. The one conclusion is don't go there. Don't okay. think about it. Yeah. <laughs> That's right.
if yeah. ever happens, like, it is only uh, confirms that application developers should implement proper retry logic. Always. Yeah. If transaction fails, code should be ready to retry it. That's it. The universal solution to everything. We should rename this to uh, just do it in the application FM. <laughs> <laughs> well. It's complicated well. FM. <laughs> it's complicated. No, it is complicated. Yeah. No, no. Jokes aside, it is. I don't know why it's so complicated, but it is. Turns out concurrency is hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I remember one of the things that I remember is that when I read this RDS article about uh, unique constraint violation causing bloat, I was shocked. I was shocked because coming from Python, I'm like encouraged to trigger exceptions. This is how I do things. I fail and then mm -hmm. I, 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 I adjust. So uh, yeah. that was very strange for me. I have this entire lecture about uh, how to handle concurrency with a show to RL system and everything. Like there's a, a problem of how you generate short random IDs. How do you do it? You need to, if you know, like a show to RL system, you need to generate keys, very small keys. So the space is limited. So you want to generate random unique keys. So how do you do it? So you end up, in a solution where you try to insert and then you loop until you don't get unique constraint violations anymore, right? And now all I'm thinking is I may have caused lots of bloat without intention. Maybe you have a better solution. By the way, it's very similar to the question about the gapless sequences. Yeah. I get that bloat is bad, right? Like I understand. I see lots of slow queries that have been a cause, like caused by bloat. But once you're aware of it, it's like something that can be managed. And you've written a great blog post about how to manage it, Hacky, as well, that I'll include. But it, it feels to me like it might be one of those pains worth paying sometimes when you're aware. Like every single Postgres table is going to have some bloat in it in a natural like work in life. You, you're not going to get it down to zero even when you do some of these uh, maintenance tasks. So we're always managing some amount. It's just like what's a, what's a healthy amount and can... Can we keep it within those boundaries? It's going to be more painful with certain workflows. Like maybe once we're getting near the end of that, like once we get past maybe halfway full of that, that space, we're starting like an average of two tries per unique URL might start to get annoying. So maybe that's the point where you start expanding the space by an extra digit or something. I don't, yeah. like, I, I imagine like once you're aware of the problems, you can design a solution that isn't that bad yeah. and then manage the bloat. Well, it all boils down to how many collisions do you actually expect to get? Yeah. I think the fact that uh, rolled back, rolled back inserts uh, cause bloat mm, makes me think that only undo people can save us someday. And we had a quote uh, last week. Yeah, Hacky, last week we had we, a quote. We, yeah. the, the new term, undo people. Because indeed, if you think we should, about we it. We should credit Melanie. Yeah. Right. So this uh, different approach would place new row to the same position in the page, right? And if it, uh, if it, uh, committed, it's there. If, if not, like, it, I mean, the, the different approach would not cause bloats, bloat or if inserts is rolled back. Right. So this is just the design of Postgres MVCC we should blame. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's very unexpected for sure. Yeah. So, well, at least we can run very long queries without worrying about undo segments running out. <laughs> yeah, I've been there, and it's great to have an oracle, like a former oracle person, understanding the uh, downsides of undo <laughs> too, right? Um, Haki, any any last things that we should have mentioned that we didn't? No, I think that we uh, zigzagged across this article very, very nicely. Nikolai definitely delivered on his promise. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, are you planning part two with benchmarks? <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I, I still don't care much about performance in this case, but I think that I might add an update on some of the findings about how merge and insert can end Gosh. up eventually causing a uh, unique constraint violation and in, in, in non item potent results. I hope that you implemented upsert so you can identify where blog post is updated. So your AI can answer this correctly. Oh, this is a good, good goal, actually. We don't have it yet. 
Yeah. Brilliant. Misconceptions yeah. about blog posts. They never update. Challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. <laughs> Yeah, I just solved your uh, get or create problem. You can just update all the time. It's not that easy because we have many pre-processing stuff for li really long articles as yours. Because, you know, the LLM has usually has some limitation. OpenAI has like 8K tokens as input. Okay. And I'm sure your article exceeds it a lot. So I yeah. try to write shorter so, ones. Yeah. Probably no. you should have two versions. No, you know, like for people who have issues with long reads. As yeah, I do actually. You like blog posts in parts? I like short versions, till they are, but with yeah. some details. I'm a big fan of long blog posts, Hakin. I know there's a lot of others out there too. So thank you for continuing to write for us. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a something that I, I I'm going to cite for sure. Yeah. Links links will be used for, to this article. Yeah, thank you for this. I need an idea for the next one. So if you have one, ping me. Mm. I have a working title in, in my mind. It it's called "How to Take a Dump Like a Pro." I couldn't resist the title. <laughs> oh, that's that's a huge topic, actually. Yeah, I've actually had some yeah. experience with it lately, and and I think that it's uh, interesting I, to see how you can optimize PG dump with the different compression algorithms, how they affect the CP CPU, and when dumping in parallel is actually not useful at all. Uh, well, on partition tables. No, not if, you have, if you have one big table, right. then it's, it's possible, but you need to engineer yourself with uh, snapshots and repeatable retransactions. Right? <laughs> so that's common. And you use ranges of IDs. Yeah. This is what PRDB, for example, does for logical uh, replication in initialization. So it's possible, for sure. Yeah, but I do have another consideration that you didn't think about. Because one of my restrictions was that I wanted to stream the output directly to S3 and not to the local file system. Imagine that you run this in a Lambda. In this case, using parallel is problematic. But using right. a single file, you can just stream it directly and skip the file system. And also, if you want to pass the dump through some kind of encryption, then also doing things in parallel makes it a bit difficult. So, yeah, different restrictions, yeah. different solutions. Yeah. When you do this, like you, you find some like lacking feature, do you have sometimes idea to implement something? Implement? To become a hacker. To become a hacker. <laughs> oh. What, like the, contribute to Postgres? Mm. Because if you, well, dump lacks a lot of stuff all the time, like, but it's super complicated to add some things to there, but definitely it lacks a lot of stuff. So I'm curious yeah. if you had such feeling, like idea, like, well, I'm going to try to implement this. No? Well, I, I, well, I looked at the Postgres code many, many times. I think that the documentation in the source itself is absolutely excellent. I remember when we worked on this uh, hash indexes article, yeah. we looked at the actual source file. There's lots of very, very useful information. By the way, this information was a lot more useful than anything I can find online, including the documentation itself. So it was absolutely excellent. And I think that the code is very well written. I'll be honest with you, I don't think I'm capable enough to contribute to Postgres itself. But, you know, I do from time to time think about my contribution, my type of contribution to the Postgres community. And I know that the most straightforward way to contribute to Postgres is to uh, contribute code. But I feel like I contribute in my way by advocating for Postgres and educating people how to use Postgres correctly. Uh, because I believe that if people would have good systems, they'll be happy with Postgres. They'll continue using it. They'll recommend it to their friends. And this is how you build a community. So I think that I'm more capable in telling stories, educate people about Postgres, working on ETL processes and applications than I do working on, you know, the tooling, the internal stuff. There are people much smarter than me that can do this stuff. 
<laughs> I'll write about them. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, Postgres documentation lacks uh, how to recipes, and this is what you do. You describe some recipes and pros and cons. This is an excellent thing. So, yeah, war stories. You absolutely do all those things, and we really appreciate it, Haki. Thank you so much for coming on as well. It's been a Thank pleasure you. having you here. Okay. Thank you, Nikolai, Michael. Uh, it was a pleasure. This is the first time for me in a podcast. But you did great. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Thanks.